Hello, my beautiful babies, and welcome to Heretics of Dune Club Session 6. This is the final session of Heretics of Dune Club. And for this session, in this mass market paperback, you should read from pages 562 to 669, or just until the end of the novel, obviously. But you know me, I love to give you the last sentence of the last chapter. And the last sentence of the last chapter of this fantastic book is, there was no answer, but then she had not really expected an answer. We love it. We love it. Uh, fantastic. And before we get into our session, I just want to remind all of you beautiful people out there reading Dune with all of us people around the world. If you are uh, feeling it and you want to support this free book club, you can by purchasing a final Dune pack that's got some really great Heretics of Dune Club merch, including uh, some pens, a refrigerator magnet, a bookmark, and a sticker sheet, all designed by myself. So we've got some really great pens. You can get it with or without the St. Alia of the Knife pen. Uh, this one is the Church of the Divided God pen goes with this one. And then our upcoming Chapter House Dune will be the Desert Watch Center pen. And here is a image of the magnet. And yeah, so there you go. So you can get that at uh, danicaxix.bigcartel.com if you're interested. And all right, let's... Ooh, no, 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 let's go back, 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 back. That always happens. I have the same hotkeys. Here we go. All right, so um, let's do a little recap before we get into our chapters. Um, holy shit, it's the final session of Heretics of Doom Club, and everything has been leading up to this thrilling finale uh, in an all-out battle against the Anomatres and their overwhelming forces versus the Bene Gesserit and their wild Atreides talents, plus their Duncan's hidden programming. On Gamu, Lucilla and Bersmali make it to their destination, only to find it infiltrated by the Honored Matres, who have captured their Duncan and plan to mark them as their own, only to have the tables turned on them when the Gola pulls a sexual Uno reverse. On Rackus, we have Shiana, Odraid, Taraza, Waff, the priesthood. They're still hashed it out. And uh, again, <laughs> we have another Uno reverse when they convince the priesthood that the false Tuic is not the false Tuic. And uh, and then, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, the thing that I love about this book is that you're reading it and you're like, how is this going to end? It's getting really late in the game. Fuck. Like, there's only a couple chapters left. Like, how is this going to end? Like, this is so much. How are you going to wrap this all up? And he does beautifully. And he puts a little bow on it. It's like this really great... <gasps> lead up it's kind of like you know the honored mantras you have this repetitive pattern going on and at the end it's like oh there's this explosive ending going on and that's exactly what happens here so in chapter 39 we begin on gamu uh, i hate the people of this planet it's 11 p.m. and Lucilla and Bersmali have made it to Yasai and are making their way through the lower class quarter of the city. As Lucilla keeps her covert attention on the odd people of this place, the Bordanos catch her attention. And these are a people who are trained and bred to work the compression machinery that harnesses the sewer gases of the city. They have no sense of smell because they work in the sewer so you have to smell piss and shit and bombs and bacteria all fucking day and it's disgusting so they can't smell anything and they have really great shoulder and arm strength so they're kind of yoked out in the upper body area <laughs> so they can work this compression machinery later 
a group of children who are a part of a religious sect that worships the tyrant begin to follow them, intent on stoning the pair until Bersmali turns to them, clasps his hands and bows saying, Goldur, the name of their God, which is another name for the tyrant. And it was just like, ooh, these little kids. Like, I just, I love the descriptions we get of Gamu and just how bizarre this place is and how weird it is and the Bordanos and these like little kids who are looking at stone people in the middle of the night. They pass through this outdoor market and there is a sing song of shouts that filled the air as the merchants tried to attract buyers. Their voices that had the end of the workday lift a false brilliance composed of the hope that old dreams would be fulfilled, yet colored by the knowledge that life would not change for them. It occurred to Lucilla that the people of these streets pursued a fleeting dream, that the fulfillment they sought was not the thing itself, but a myth that they had been conditioned to seek, the way racing animals were trained to chase after the whirling bait on the end, uh, on the end of the endless... Uh, oval of the racetrack and i was you know when i read that i really thought like the american dream <laughs> you know like the american dream the american dream like anything it has its positives and it has its negatives where it's like oh anyone can come here and there's no set hierarchy and you can rise within the ranks and you can become a rich person from being a poor person and that absolutely does happen there are people i've seen people who have come from humble beginnings who are now very rich indeed. You know, I've seen the American dream unfold before my eyes, but unfortunately that doesn't happen for everybody. And for most people, it's like this kind of, it is this like carrot on the end of the stick that's dangling that people are just kind of chasing, but it never will occur for them. But at the same time, you go to another place like England, Akira the Dawn has talked about this, where they have the monarchy and you will never, like no matter what you do, you will not be a part of the monarchy. Like you have your place in the hierarchy. Your place is set for you. You're not going higher. I mean, you can go lower, but like you're not going any higher. And with that comes, I mean, A, there's like a little bit of security in that and, and comfort in that. But then also there's like a malaise that comes with that as well, where you don't try harder because, you know, you can never get anywhere so you're just like okay well whatever i'm just a piece of shit i'm just gonna do this so i mean it's interesting like they they both of these two things have you know different pros and different cons for sure lucilla notices a pair of Liloxu masters in disguise this is like i laughed so hard at this she's like going into the market and she sees some guy in a hat and a fucking coat haggling with some other guy over some fruit. And these guys are really people who are just like hanging out watching because they're looking for Lucilla and Duncan and, uh, and Tag. And so they're haggling at the stall and she realizes that it's two Leiloxu masters. One is sitting on the top of the shoulders of the other one and they're wearing a coat like they're like one tall guy you know and it's like what like they're pulling that fucking gag right now like i love the gag of two little people like children it's usually children in a coat in a hat trying to like trick people into thinking that they are an adult i know alrock it's totally some cartoon shit it like really cracked me up there's also a fantastic scene where she looks at an alleyway and she notices a man with this tall device of whirling lights and it's called a hypno bong and it's been outlawed on most civilized worlds and a customer comes and he gives him some money and he leans into the basin that's made of lights you know puts his face in it and then oh, he lifts with the shutter and he kind of staggers out of the alleyway and it's like what the fuck is going on with the hypno bong like oh my god like i yeah, hypno blaze it. Totally. Rakatiga. I was like cracking the fuck up reading about the hypno bong. Um, and another weirdo she sees is a tall man in a wide brimmed hat sitting on some steps with these really long arms wrapped around his legs. And he has like these like, I mean, his face is in shadow, but you can still see the animal glow of his eyes in the shadows. And this is a futar. Uh, which is an animal who's been crossed with 
a human, a hunting animal cross with a human, and these are mistakes from the scattering. Lucilla thinks like, ugh, a mistake. Ugh, disgusting. They crossed a hunting animal with a human? This is not okay with me and my Bene Gesserit sensibilities. And we will see more of the Futars in Chapter House Dune Club. Eventually, these two duck into a dive for some food, where Bursmali, disguised as Scar, orders himself and his honored Matre play femme some drinks. And he's like, let me order for you. He orders them some drinks. They come through this automata, that automata, where it comes up just, you know, they order it, boop, 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 there, there's no waiter. And then it comes up through the table. And it's this milky caffeinated drink made from nut juices. <laughs> and it, and uh, it tastes very chemically. And she's not excited about drinking it, but she drinks it. And uh, they leave and they enter a building in the slums. They climb some stairs and enter into a room where they're greeted by this old woman who happens to be a native of Rackus, who is on their side and helping them to find a way to the planet. Lucilla angers Bursmali when she insults the old woman and she realizes she's like, wait, I didn't imprint on him. Like when we had sex before we left, I didn't do like the full I didn't give him the full thing. You know, I didn't do like my whole imprinting thing on him. So why is he like worried about me? You know, like I don't get it. But then she realizes that he's scared for her because he recognized that she hates the people of this planet. She is just filled with disgust all these fucking weirdos she sees and she knows that that is a dangerous emotion for a reverend mother because where hate entered love might follow they should be very much uh, in control of their emotions they should not show hatred so easily when they're alone he tells her that look we both need to get some rest we got a long trip in front of us he um he goes and sits down on the couch and lucilla gives him a little quip she's like oh so i don't have to earn my money I don't have to fuck you again. You know, and he's like, look, man, we were just doing what we had to. Okay. Like, please, like, please. We were lucky that we weren't stopped and it totally could have happened. So like, don't be mad that like you had sex with me. Okay. Burz Molly lays on the couch and passes out, but Lucilla cannot sleep and her inner vision comes to her and she sees this memory of from when she was a baby cradled in her mother's arms, walking through the daylight in the streets and like she just remembers the warmth you know of the heartbeat of her mother like being so close to her mother's breast and and she cries there's tears that come out of her eyes and she realized that gamu had touched her more deeply than any experience since her first days in the Bene Gesserit schools her whole experience here at the keep with duncan with brismali through all of this it has very much changed her and it has been a real experience for this lady. It's been a lot. It's been a lot. Chapter 40. We will serve you in all ways except one. On Rackus, we have a powder keg of a meeting between Taraza, Odraid, Shiana, Waff, the false Tuic, nine of his counselors, a bunch of Bene Gesserit security cards and an equal number of fixed dancers. Okay, so there's just, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot going on in this room. They are in a penthouse atop the Dares Balat Museum. And Odraid reflects that this is a Western facing room. The windows face towards the West. And classically and symbolically, the West represents the past and it represents death because the sun sets in the west you know like that's the end of the day it heralds the night and she's like what is that bode for this fucking meeting also i mean there is a display case with one of hui Nuri's gowns in it so it's just like oh my god there's even a dead woman's dress in this room you know it's just like oh my gosh these this is a little ominous the priests are in one corner and they're hotly fighting amongst each other about who will take over as the high priest. Each one of them wants themselves to take over, of course. Taraza, Odraid, and Shiana uh, are observing the scene together in their own little group, while an uncertain Waff and his face dancers are standing apart 
in their little entourage. And the false Tuick explodes in anger at his bickering counselors. And Albertus, the priest, he calls on Waff to control his face dancer. Bring your face dancer to heal. Waff hesitates and then he kind of like moves forward. The false Tuick whirls towards him and demands he stay where the fuck he is and you better not interfere with anything that's happening right now. And Waff is like, wait a minute, what? This is a face dancer. Like, I am a master. Like, what is going on right now? And he starts doing this, like, humming, this, like, ominous tone that is, like, some secret Leilaksu language between masters and face dancers. And all the other face dancers, when they hear this humming, they're like, oh. And, uh, but not false to it. He is totally unfazed by the humming. And he just, like, ignores it. And then eventually turns back around and is like points a finger at him being like, stay out of this. Okay. And he's talking to his counselors. You may be able to do away with me, but you'll not saddle me with this Leilaksu filth. <laughs> and like, Waff is like, what is happening right now? Like, why don't I have control over this motherfucker? This face dancer has gone over the edge and he is such a perfect mimic that he really believes that he's Tuick now. Like he does, he's no longer a face dancer. Like he really has become Tuick. Terraza looks on the scene with amusement, uh, admonishing Waff, saying that like, this is your fault, okay? Like, don't look at me, this is your fault because you did too good of a job creating these new face dancer mimics of yours, okay? You did too good of a job and now they really are mimicking and they're not in your control anymore. Meanwhile, the priests uh, are ignoring all of this. They continue to argue, calling Tuik a damn face dancer. And, you know, he responds to them. You can kill me if you want. But remember, God knows what's in your hearts. Okay. And this false Tuik is so sincere that these priests are now wondering if he really is a face dancer. Because none of them actually saw Tuik die. Uh, nobody saw a body. All they know is that the Bene Gesserit and the Laksu told him, told them that Tuik was replaced, but like, they could have lied. They're fucking liars. Like, like how would, like, how do you know? How would you know? How would you know? Odrade takes the lead and she votes, let's keep, let's keep Tuik where he is. We love him. We want to keep him as the high priest. Waff agrees with her. The counselors ask, wait, is this, wait, is this guy a fucking face dancer or not? Like, what is going on right now? Taraza steps in. She asks the false Tuik if he is false. And he is like, of course not. No, I am the real Tuik. And he really does believe that. And she's like, well, I guess it seems there's been some mistake. I guess he's the real one. And, uh... Odrade asks Shiana to chime in on all this, and she's like, you know what, what, what do you think the Church of the Divided God should be doing right now? And she says, they shall continue to serve God. <laughs> and then, like, Taraz is like, okay, this meeting's over. Uh, like, get the fuck out of here. Tuik, I'm going to give you a squad of my Bene Gesserit guardians, and they're going to protect you, and you can command them, and, you know, these motherfuckers aren't going to kill you. Now, before, if it was exposed that the Leilaksu had replaced the high priest with a face dancer, this would have brought a lot of heat down upon the Leilaksu. And because the Bene Gesserit could expose this plot at any time, you know, the, they had the upper hand on the Leilaksu. But now that Odrade and Taraza have convinced the priests that the false Tuik is the real Tuik, the Leilaksu were off the hook from that. And... Waff is really puzzled. He's like, why are you helping me right now? And Taraz explains that she's released their grip on the Bene Lilacs as a show of faith in their alliance. And in re return, demands to know what they have done to their Gola and what they hope to gain with this Duncan. Waff is caught between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, there's the Bene Gesserit, who are incredibly dangerous, yet their value is incalculable to their potential ascendancy. On the other hand, he can't shake the Leilaksu have returned from the scattering without inviting attack by the honored Montre. So he's playing this double game and he's kind of fucked either way. 
And he's backed into a corner and he is ready to bite his way out if necessary. Ac Taraza accuses him of dishonoring himself in the land of the prophet by not sharing openly as he said that he would. Waf counters that he is aware that the Bene Gesserit are trying to rule them. And even though they may have lessened their grip, he still feels their, thing their fingers around his throat. To even the playing field a little bit for Waf, the Reverend Mother Superior drops the fact that a Reverend Mother has never returned from the scattering because she believes that they were subverted by something out there, which is a chilling thought. She also lets Waf know that she knows that they are playing a double game and that they're still also dealing with the scattered ones. She steps towards him away from her guardian sisters and she's made a decision so dangerous to the sisterhood that she involuntarily shivers. Oh, just like Odraid had her shuddering moment, so does Taraza. Taraza now gambles on a very bold supposition. She tells him, we will serve you in all ways but one. We will never become a receptacle for Golas. None of us is now nor will ever be an axolotl tank. And they don't know for sure if they're using the Leiloxi women for this, but they're pretty sure they gamble on it. And Waf is like, fuck, oh my God, she knows, she knows too much. He raises his hand to uh, give the command for his face dancers to attack, but Taraza stops him. If you complete that gesture, you will lose everything. The messenger of God will turn her back upon you and the words of the prophet will be dust in your mouths. Odraid said that we should share everything. And you said you would share too, and Shiana listens with the ears of the prophet. So what say you, Abdel? You gonna share what? Taraza then turns her back on him in this superpower move and gives Odraid a little smile to her saying, it's time for your punishment. I'm getting ready to punish you, Odraid. And she turns and says, you know what, the Leiloxu desire and Atreides for breeding, I give you Darwi Odraid. More will be supplied, damning Odraid to whatever Leiloxu terrible plots they have in store for her. Waf breaks down. He spills the tea on the honored matres. He says that these women can elicit total sensual involvement from the male with magnified multiple orgasmic waves that can be continued by the female for an extended period. So it's not just spurt and you're done it's like oh my god it hits you and then it hits you again and then it hits you again and then it hits you again and then you're like ah and then you're just like you you just fuck it. it's crazy it's like out of control it takes over all of your senses and uh waf tells him too that they have duplicated this process among their face dancers and he has even experienced it himself before but he had the female female face dancer immediately destroy itself so that it will not have a hold on him. Um, but how that was hard to do and that he would have obeyed her without question if she had asked him anything. And before he shows them how this is done, he warns them that if the Bene Gesserit ever try this shit on the Bene Lilacs, bloody slaughter will follow. Taraza assures him, don't worry, we are not dumb enough to use these tricks because they would only end up destroying us in the end. So now he has his face dancers give everyone a little demonstration of how the honored matres work. And later, Odraid wonders if it was wise to let Shiana witness this performance. Uh, this little girl definitely got horny watching this whole situation. And Odraid's like, we are going to have to bring in some training males a little bit sooner for this one. And is Shiana going to use what she's learned from this performance on men? OK, we've just given we've just given this girl a dangerous power. And now we've got to explain to her why she can't use it. In her mind, she compares this demonstration to Cyanoke, the dance that she saw down in the Great Square of Keene with both, they both have these long-term rhythms heading towards these explosive endings. And Odraid remembers a conversation with Shiana that she had after observing Cyanoke. And Shiana asks her, you know, why do you always talk about hurting and punishment? And Odraid tells her, you must learn discipline. 
how can you control others if you cannot control yourself? Shiana says she doesn't like that lesson. And Audrey tells her none of us does very much until later when we've learned the value of it by experience. And that's just like a really wonderful observation by Frank Herbert. Like how, like, if you can't even control yourself, how do you expect to control other people? And that's a real thing that I see all the time. It's like everyone's always trying to tell other people what to do and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, but meanwhile, they just have literally like no control over their own compulsions. And it's just like this sick game. And it's just like so fucked. And it's it's not healthy. Um, Shiana has told uh, Shiana had told the Reverend Mother at the end, though, of how Cyanoke, when everyone rushes the dancers, some of them are killed right then and there, and they go straight to Shaitan. But some of them escape, and the ones who survive end up going to this great dance in the desert after they recover. And if Shaitan comes, if they draw a worm with their dance, you know, they die. But if Shaitan does not come, they are rewarded. And they are given money or a space in the bazaar or whatever the fuck. And the priests say that these people have proved and have proved that they are human. It's kind of like a Reikian gomjabar. Shiana then enters the room and tells Adraid that Teraza wants to see her. And before they leave, Shiana admits that she doesn't know very much. And Odraid comments to her, none of us does, child except that we were all in this dance together and Shaitan will certainly come if the least of us fails. I think that's a really beautiful quote. That's a really nice, nice one. That's we're all in this dance together. The dance of reality as Alejandro Jodorowsky would call it. Chapter 41. I am called Mirbella. She's finally here. <laughs> I, I love Mirbella. I just can't wait for you guys to read Chapter House because she is wild. Mirbella is a wild. Lucilla and Burz Molly are back on the move. They're heading towards the outskirts of Yasai to meet up with Duncan. And even though she has been reassured of Burz Molly's abilities, it's like, she's like, he's a competent man. The Reverend Mother is still doubtful of these completely safe places that they're heading to. She's like, nowhere is completely safe. There's no such thing as complete safety, but okay. They leave the road. They go onto a snowy path. They go up the steps of this old mag shoot up to this old commercial building. And first Molly tries to mansplain to Lucilla and say, oh, this was a factory in the old days. She's like, I have eyes and a memory. Okay. Did this grunting male think her completely devoid of intelligence? Uh, I was cracking up at Burz Molly trying to mansplain to Lucilla. It was really funny. They head down into a cellar door and a woman in a version of Lucilla's dragon robe trots up to them. And she is a young honored matre with great skin. And she has been sent to watch the place. She mistakes Lucilla for an actual honored matre. But she sees through Burz Molly's disguise as a customer. Lucilla covers for him and she's like, well, this is my guide. And uh, Burz Molly makes the mistake of asking the young, young woman, well, weren't we expected? Ah, it speaks. <laughs> I prefer that you do not refer to me as an it, says Burz Molly. She's like, I'll call Gamu Scott. Gum, anything I wish. Don't speak to me of your preferences. I call you anything. I choose scum. <laughs> First Molly <laughs> cannot. He makes another mistake and he attacks this woman. She drops under his slap, catches his sleeve in a blindingly fast pirouette and sends his ass sprawling and is ready to give him a life ending kick until Lucilla folds sideways, folds sideways, barely avoiding the foot, and dumps Mirbella's ass on the floor with a blow to the abdomen. She tells the younger woman, a suggestion that you might kill my guide is uncalled for, whatever your name is. Mirbella then introduces herself. I am Mirbella, and pronounces that she has been shamed by being defeated by such a slow attack, and she doesn't understand why Lucilla 
would kick her ass with such a slow attack, but it's because Lucilla can't move as fast as she does. Like, there's no way Lucilla can move as fast as she does, but that doesn't mean she can't still kick her ass. Lucilla covers for herself. She's like, well, you you needed a lesson. So, and Marbella admits that she's only been newly robed and begs for forgiveness and thanks Lucilla for the splendid lesson, which she has now memorized and will put to good use from now on. And she will thank Lucilla every time she kicks someone's ass with that move that she just learned. She bows with an impish grin. Lucilla uses the old, do you know who I am trick? <laughs> and does not forgive Mirbella or give her her name. Mirbella reports that, uh, great honored Matre, we have captured the Gola. And I was just about to bet him when you arrived. Lucilla tries to command the younger woman not to bed the Gola, but is rebuffed. Fair game, great honored Matre. I marked him first. She laughs and then motions them to a place where they can watch the show. All right, on to chapter 42. <sighs> yeah, Davy Soccer, she's like, I went slow on purpose. <laughs> she did not go slow on purpose. Chapter 42, my hands are fire. My hands are fire. Here we go. Duncan is awake. He's trying to remember where the fuck he is. The last thing he remembers is entering a dark building and then all these lights flaring. And then he sees like all this blood spurting from Torms's eyeballs. And he's like, oh, well, Torms is dead. And all he knows now is that the back of his head hurts and he's currently paralyzed and his mind is just like darting all over the place. He thinks back to a day on Giddy Prime where he's watching a group of young men playing this kind of bowling type game. And he's with a female who then betrayed him to the Harkonnens immediately after. Then he remembers the Gamu Keep. He remembers Teg's last stand. He remembers trudging through the snow with Tormsa to a Harkonnen outpost built of native dirt uh, and then turned into a giant brick when it was superheated with a wide bore burner, which is like so insane. Like, it's like, okay, so wait, they, they got all this mud, they formed them into bricks, they all stacked them together, and then they got this crazy burner, and then they just <laughs> like set this fucking thing on fire and glazed it into a fucking giant brick right then and there. And what's even crazier is that the burner that they used is the same burner they used for uh, controlling mobs, which is just setting a lot of people on fire, which is like, oh my God, the Harkonnens are the worst. They're fucking terrible. He remembers Yasai as it used to be, as Barony, a place with no ground level opening, utilizing suspensor guide beams to transport people and goods through the city, like a worm track through like a giant apple. It was a place built for maximum stuffing with minimum expenditure on materials where the only human oriented spaces were at the top. Uh, in the penthouses where the rich lived away from the crush beneath them, where the lower classes were conditioned to think the outside was dangerous and the only better life was up, which you could only get to through absolutely abasing servility. He remembers looking at himself in a mirror and Duke Leto announcing the royal command for dinner time with a cute little smile. And he remembers Torms' death and an oval face above him. This face says to him, my name is Mirbella. You will not remember, but I share it now as I mark you. I have selected you. He looks into her cold green eyes, staring into his, and he feels something touch his cheek. And he opens his eyes and he's like, wait, this isn't a memory. This is happening now. He is naked on a sleeping pad and Marbella is back, naked above him, touching him simultaneously in many places and humming softly. Man, there's all this humming going on. There's a lot of humming in this book, people. Hmm. I, would like, I would love to know more about Frank Herbert and his obsession with people humming and like how that affects the human psyche. 
Duncan's dick is now so fucking hard that it hurts. Okay. His, uh, he's got a raging boner. He's powerless against this woman's touches, her tongue, her humming, her mouth, her nipples all over his fucking body. I feel so good. She did this when she marked him and now she's back and she's doing it again. And he looks over and he sees Bursmali and a pissed Lucilla watching from behind the plaza barrier. But he's like, wait, am I seeing things? Is that Lucilla over there? Like, he doesn't really know. Mirbella murmurs in his ear, my hands are fire. And he feels fire wherever she touches him. And, uh, but wait a minute, wait, what is this feeling? A flame engulfs his mind and he sees this sausage string of red capsules in his awareness. And these little capsules are his other lives. And these capsules burst and he is flooded with the other memories of his serial lives as his, all of his other Gola selves. And he relives all of these deaths being crushed under Leto over and over. Leto crushed that motherfucker a lot. And he remembers it every fucking time. He remembers a thopter crash. He remembers dying by uh, a fish speaker assassin's knife. He remembers everything, but not just all of his deaths. He remembers his lives too. He remembers the smell of a newborn daughter in his arms. He remembers the musky odors of a passionate mate. He remembers the flavor of a Danian wine. And he remembers the axolotl takes. Mechanical hands that pulled him out and rotated him. And in the unfocused blurs of the newborn, he saw a great mound of female flesh, monstrous in her almost immobile grossness. A mass of dark tubes linked her body to giant metal containers. Disgusting. The secret of the axolotl tanks. Axolotl tanks are people. <laughs> They're people, they're women, they're Leiloxu women. Leiloxu are so gross that they've taken all of their females and they've turned them into these disgusting immobile tanks where they just give birth to golas and spice and sligs and all sorts of terrible things. And most importantly, he finally remembers what the Leiloxu planted inside him, a thing that's been waiting for the seduction of a Bene Gesserit imprinter. But wait a minute, this isn't a Bene Gesserit imprinter. This is an honored matre. But no matter, the patterns take over his reactions. Now Duncan starts humming, um, touching her back, touching her vagina, her hands are fluttering, his mouth is moving all over. And uh, Marbella is like, whoa, what the f fuck is going on right now and she tries to push away but oh my god this feels so good holy rock of dur how does he know how to touch me there and just at that instant and there and there and she is so aroused man she is spreading them legs wide she is ready for it but she fights back in the only way she knows how with more touching and caressing using all of the honored matre techniques that she's been taught but duncan counters each of her moves with a in a widely stimulating way it's too late she can't control herself anymore and was re reacting automatically from some deeper well of knowledge other than her training he, you know it is sexual combat 100 percent limited knowledge it is sexual combat he enters her and it's game over it's game over and she thinks to herself how did he do this to me Waves of ecstatic contractions began in the smooth muscles of her pelvis. She sensed his simultaneous response and felt the hard slap of his ejaculation. This heightened her own response. Ecstatic pulsations drove outward from the contractions in her vagina, outward outward. The ecstasy engulfed her entire sensorium. She saw a spreading blaze of whiteness against her eyelids. Every muscle quivered with an ecstasy she had not imagined for her possible for herself. Again and again, she lost count of the repetitions. When Duncan moaned, she moaned, and the waves swept outward once more and again. There was no sensation of time or surroundings, only this immersion in a continuing ecstasy. She wanted it to go on forever, and she wanted it to stop 
This should not be happening to a female. An honored matre must not experience this. These were the sensations by which men were governed. <sighs> Woo! It's a hot chapter. It's a good one. Duncan emerges from his response pattern and knows that there is something else that he was supposed to do. Oh, yeah, I'm supposed to kill. I'm supposed to kill uh, Lucilla. But this is not Lucilla. This is Marbella. This is not a Bene Gesserit. So never mind. <laughs> I won't kill her. It's fine. As they both start to recover, Mar Marbella tries to roll away, but she's just so fucking spent. And she she's like, I got to tell them about this. This girl has to die. Like, I, I want to kill him, but I want to fuck him again. And he could ask me anything and I would do it. And she's having a real freak out. She looks to the great honored Matre, Lucilla, for help. And she rolls towards the door and unlocks it. She's finally able to stand and tries to crush Duncan's larynx, which he easily dodges. Lucilla catches Marbella and she begs her to kill him. Um, but feels hands pressing on her neck at some nerve bundles behind her ears. And the last thing Marbella hears before going unconscious is the great honored Montre saying, we will kill no one. This Gola goes to Rackus. Woo. What a spicy chapter, everyone. Oh, goodness. Wow. I will say the first time I read that chapter, I, I, yeah, I, I just immediately was like, OK, I got to go fuck now. <laughs> and then I did. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> I don't know about you guys. I don't know. Did any of you like were like, oh, oh, I got to put this. I need to go do something. I'll be back. I'll be back, dude. I'll be back. Uh, oh, yeah. Sly Raider says yes. It's like, oh, a tough love buddy. I was 14 when I read. Well, you didn't have the opportunity. Um, uh, but you know, I know this book did totally just climax. Absolutely. Kazmataz. The spice was absolutely flowing the scribe in that chapter. Um, but yeah, I know. It's like, I know I need a Siggy now. <laughs> totally tech for me. <laughs> uh, Davey says you did eat a girl afterwards. Hey, we'll take it. We'll take it. We will take it. <laughs> absolutely. Frank Herbert. Yes, we love it. I just, I wish Frank Herbert had written more pervert chapters for us perverts, but you know, whatever. It's fine. I'm so glad we got what we got. Um, so as we go to our next chapter, chapter 43, death or obedience. Meanwhile, while all this pervert shit is going on. Meanwhile, Teg is in an armored ground car with Muzaffar, and they head to one of the Bene Gesserit safe houses, uh, which was a bank, which has been recently taken over, and uh, it's not really safe anymore. And this place is a place of such fabulous wealth that the energy barriers employed on this building to protect it uses as much energy as a large city would use throughout its entire lifetime. Okay. That's a lot. Muzaffar prepares Miles for his meeting with an honored Matre, being warned to address her only as honored Matre and nothing else. Noting that she expects total obedience, the field marshal gives Teg a fresh change of clothes, the familiar black uniform of the Bene Gesserit Bashar. He is taken to a room that he's seen before, even though they don't know that he knows of this place. He knows of this place. And this is a meeting room where high level business goes down and it's covered in concealed calm eyes with the uh, and it has the softest white dew carpet underfoot where it, this carpet looks like it's wet, but it's not wet, <laughs> which is really interesting. And there is a table surrounded by four admirals chairs where they're comfortable, but not too comfortable because you need to stay alert in whatever meetings are going down in this crazy place. An old woman with a shimmering gold robe enters the room and commands Muzaffar to leave them. The field commander leaves to be paid in honored Matre pussy for bringing Teg to them. She says to, to Teg, you recognize this as a bank. 
there are always means of transferring large sums or selling power. And I do not speak of power that runs factories, but of power that runs people. Tag responds, yes, and that usually passes under the strange names of government or society and uh, civilization. <laughs> The woman compliments Miles' intelligence and tells him that she thinks of herself as a banker and asks him if he objects to anything that's been done to him. And he's like, well, my objections like really don't matter. She asks, well, do you think others have ever objected to what you have done to them? And he's like, undoubtedly. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. She tells him that she thinks that Miles will be very valuable to them. And he responds, telling them that he's felt that he's always the most valuable to himself which is not the answer she was looking for. Flecks of orange drift across the whites of her eyes, and uh, she warns him that if she ever sees her eyes go fully orange, she will be offended beyond her ability to tolerate. So if they go full orange, you're fucked. Okay, I'm just letting you know. She discusses how he may never command her, but she loves that he can command the muck outside. Wretched everyday people whose only concerns are for their basic survival. Just how the honored Montres want them, unfocused on the great issues outside of their immediate needs. Being a hater of oppression in all of its forms, Teg is disgusted with this woman's view of people who believes they must be carefully dissuaded from any true improvement and towards something they call protective ignorance. Um, they teach that all new knowledge can be dangerous and it is non-survival. So the honored mantras are an interesting opposite to the Bene Gesserit, where the Bene Gesserit want to improve humanity and mature humanity and bring their awareness levels up, but that these women want to keep people ignorant as possible so she they can continue to control them in that way. Muzaffar uh, returns. He's been cunt stricken and he stands behind the old woman uh, in a daze. <laughs> And Teg is wondering, what the fuck happened? He doesn't know what happened. He's like, what the fuck just happened to this guy? Is he on some new drug? Is this man on drugs? What's happening right now? And he asks them, like, you you found some drug? And uh, some new one? And she says, no, Bashar, we have an old one. Lol. Really funny. He asks her if they would make an addict of him. And she tells him, like all the others that they control, he has a choice. Death or obedience. And it's like, well, that's really not much of a choice, but okay. Tag really takes a look at this pair and he finds that there is something deeply evil about them. And neither of them really enjoy life. Theirs would have to be mostly a voyeur's existence. The eternal observer, always remembering what it had been like before they had taken the turning into whatever it was that they had become. Even when they wallowed in the performance of something that once had meant gratification, they would have to reach for new extremes each time just to touch the edges of their own memories. Not a milligram of naivety remained in either of these two. Nothing was expected to surprise them. Nothing could be truly new for them. Still, they plotted and devised, hoping this extreme would produce the remembered thrill. They knew it would not, of course, and they expected to carry away from the experience only more burning rage out of which to fashion another attempt at the unreachable. That was how their thinking went. It's like, oh, sucks. They live in that addict life, just empty, uh, you know, like, uh, it's like you've gone too far. They've gone way too far over the edge. Teg then designed a smile for them using all the skills he learned at the Bene Gesserit hands. It was a smile full of compassion and understanding and real pleasure in his own existence. He knew it for the most deadly insult he could hurl at them, and he saw it hit. Ugh, Teg is so based. Oh, I'm gonna give you a smile. I am understanding, compassionate, and I love myself. Everything that you guys aren't, 
and they're like ah, like so cool amazing love it we love you tag Muzaffar glowers at the Bashar and the honored Matre is at first outraged with a capital orange eyes but then finding she is surprised at something new and unexpected the orange dissipates and she asks Muzaffar to bring the honored Matre who has been chosen to mark their Bashar Tag's doubled vision warns him of peril and sees his future path, the path of a murderous whirlwind killing everyone in his path and agrees, yes, bring this honored matre to me because that would be one less motherfucker I've got to seek out and destroy in this fucking building. <laughs> oh, we love you, Tag. I know, I know. He's the best. I know, Tag laying down simple sick burns. It's just, um, we love you. So good. I know you cannot hold the whirlwind. That's a great callback, Slay Raider. The Alia callback there. I love that. <clears throat> Chapter 44. I have won. Back on Rackus, Terraza is on the rooftop garden at Dar S. Balat. Audrey joins her and they discuss the chaotic reports coming in from Gamu and the tyrant's words. The Bene Gesserit are so close to what they should be, yet so far. Taraza shares that she believes that the tyrant is still out there. All those pearls of awareness locked within the sandworms caught in an endless dream. And Shiana speaks to him. She believes all the forces the tyrant put into motion are still out there roaming in the desert. Shiana comes onto the roof and Taraza thinks back on the girl's dance performance the previous night in the great museum against the spice tapestries and how this dance is her language that they must learn. A withdrawn waff is with the group as well as a young Reikian priest named Tulashan who is stoked to be here for Shiana's upcoming demonstration of dancing a worm for them and he thinks he's going to go far in the priesthood but really he's been chosen because he's expendable it's been a busy week and Odrade has had her hands full with Shiana's sexual education since watching the face dancers performance <laughs> and uh, seeing the honored Montre's sexual power. And Taraza is not stoked that Lucilla isn't here to do this chore. Uh, she's like, Lucilla would be better than Adrade. I mean, Adrade's great, but like Lucilla would be better for this. And she's definitely not happy with the available teaching males here on Rackus after using one one evening and being like, not worth it. Meh. <laughs> like the, the sex, meh. It's not worth it. This is, this is just not worth my time. The Reverend Mother Superior has listened in on Odrade's lesson to Shiana the day before. And the girl is asking, why must she not use any of the things she saw those face dancers do? Like, what are the whores doing wrong? They seem to be doing great. I mean, they're controlling worlds. And Odrade asks Shiana to imagine what counterforces these honored mantras are calling forth by the use of this power. How people will develop uh, that will be able to resist and how they are here because they see the old empire as an easy conquest, but even so, the honored matres are good for the Bene Gesserit overall in the long run. She's like, these whores are crazy. <laughs> they're, they're calling into forces that are fucked up, but you know what? We love them. We're glad that we're here because Bene Gesserit have big, been static in the core of their old empire and all the life and movement and newness are out there in the scattering. And here is finally a chance for the Bene Gesserit to get off their asses and help strengthen whatever forces are out there that can resist these honored mantras. Thopters with the very important observers, the VIOs, are arriving for Shiana's demonstration. And Shiana, Odrade, Waff, and Tulashan leave Taraza on the roof to go back inside. Taraza's hanging out and she notices the sound of the thopter is off, like it's too heavy. And as the first one lifts over the roof, 
She sees an armored cockpit and recognizes the treachery before the beam shoots out and cuts off her legs below the knees. Then another beam slices at an angle across her hip. Holy shit. Reverend Mother Superior is down. The pain is great, although not as bad as the spice agony. And she cuts the blood flow from her wounds, knowing that she is about to die and thinks to herself, ha ha, I have won. Odrade comes out, says nothing, puts her forehead on Teraza's temple and allows the dying woman to pull out to pour out her life and her other memories into Odrade, hoping that Odrade will be able to escape this attack. So just like, give me your memories. Uh, Shiana watches this whole thing going on from the penthouse. Waff and Tulashan uh, were already out of the room and did not return because they weren't in on it. Fuckers. Odrade returns to Shiana and grabs all of the glow globes she can like balloons gives some to the girl and they use them to escape down an air shaft into a pump room. So it's like, hold on to these, <laughs> these suspenser balloon glow globes. Like we're fucking, uh, Mary Poppins and go down this air shaft and, uh, and they have to get to a no room and they have to get the fuck out of here and get out into the desert. Shiana laments the poor dead mother superior, but Audrey lets her know, I am the mother superior right now. Okay. At least temporarily. And these whores are attacking and we have got to go. We got to hustle. On to our next chapter. We came prepared. I know I'm Mary Poppins y'all totally sparky. <laughs> this is totally a Mary Poppins y'all moment. 100%. <laughs> it's totally a hundred percent. Um, so <clears throat> chapter 45, we came prepared. We're back on Gamu. Tag has finally figured out the nature of the honored Matre's threat, their sexual threat. And that monstrous threat met his monstrous countermeasures. Just as, as just as Odrade was like, you know, these women are calling fucked up forces into being. And then Tag's over here like, yeah, I'm fucking, I'm countering these bitches like a motherfucker. And so is Duncan. Anyways, Bay, he has gone whirlwind mode and he has slaughtered more than 50 people with his bare fucking hands on his way out of this bank, including that old bitch whose last living expression was that of real surprise and Muzaffar. Sorry, not going to see that frame bush home <laughs> ever again. Tag thinks that the sisterhood is right to call them whores. You could drag humankind almost anywhere by manipulating the enormous energies of procreation. You could goad humans into actions they would never have believed possible. One of his teachers had said it directly. This energy must have an outlet. Bottle it up and it becomes monstrously dangerous. Redirect it and it will sweep over anything in its path. That is the ultimate secret of all religions. I mean, just check out the Catholic Church. You know what I'm saying? See how they've bottled it up and how they've redirected it and have swept over <laughs> fucking all sorts of shit over however many hundreds or thousands or whatever fucking probably like i don't know how old is the catholic church is it thousands of years old or we're a thousand or more anyways whatever you know what i mean it's a thing it's old as shit yes it's not two thousand years old because that's like christianity started about two thousand years ago so they weren't there then whatever we're moving on Teg is back in normal time. And even though he's safely out of the building, he knows that he didn't kill everyone and that somebody has seen what he can really do. He looks down at his hand. He sees that it's bleeding. His blood is almost black, possibly from excess oxygen in his blood. He's like, what the fuck has happened to me? Crisis has tipped him over into another dimension of human possibilities. Using his new abilities, Teg senses that a man is near who knows everyone Teg requires for what he's about to do. And he lets himself be led down an alleyway and into a doorway marked personal service. Inside is a restaurant that has actual waiters instead of stupid automata, like the uh, like in the dive that Lucilla and Bersmali got their drinks at. 
So this is like, this is like a throwback restaurant where it's like, we actually have printed menus and waiters, like check us out. And it is a very in establishment. And uh, it's an in establishment that you told your friends about your latest discovery with an admonition to not spread the word. You don't want to spoil it with crowding. This idea had always abused Teg. You spread the word about such places, but you did it under the guise of keeping it a secret. I was like, oh my God, that's so real. That's such a real observation, Frank Herbert. We do do that. I've done that. I, I've had other people do that. They're like, hey, I'll tell you about this place, but you can't tell anyone about it. And then of course you're gonna be like, do the same thing. Like, oh, hey, oh, it's so real. Anyways. He's met by a hostess who takes him to, I know, the, the first rule of Fight Club. Absolutely. It's like Fight Club. Exactly. It's like, don't talk about Fight Club. But then everyone's like, oh, it's a secret. Oh. He Inside, he's met by a hostess who takes him to a seat in the corner where he can have his back against a wall so he's protected against threats. And he scans the room. He looks at the other diners. He checks out the paper menu. He notices this place is pretending to be thrifty. So it's like cool. You know, which I, I love the description of this restaurant, which is like, oh, like the waiter's got like a little darning and oh, the, you know, the uh, tablecloths, you know, they've been like sewn and stuff. But it's like it's all fake. Like this place has so much money. They're just pretending to be thrifty, to be cool. Um, and it's totally hipster shit. Absolutely. But it works. Works like a charm. A waiter appears who knows exactly who Teg is and gives him some salve for his hand and bandages his wounds. This man served under him at Rindatai and is ready to serve him again, only this time in free food. The Bashar orders a great deal of food, and he tells him, keep bringing it until I tell you to stop, or until you feel that I have overstepped your generosity. And it's like, what a cute tagism, of course. You know, he's like, just keep bringing it, or until you feel like I'm eating way fucking too much because like I can't pay for any of this. He's such a sweet baby. The waiter returns with some soup while the rest of his meal is being prepared. And Tag asks after another one of the diners, one of the regulars, and his name is Professor Delnay. And the man, this is the man that Tag senses um, say that he's looking for. Like, this is the guy. And he tells the waiter to ask the professor to join him when his dessert comes. Tag once again eats like a motherfucker so much and when the professor finally comes and sits down with miles he exclaims that was the most remarkable gastronomic performance he has ever seen and are you sure you can eat dessert after all that and miles says two or three of them at least the professor is like astonishing wow amazing he starts it on dessert and the two men talk Teg asks the professor to risk his life by helping him get to a meeting place of his old soldiers. Delnay thinks that they can smuggle him through the streets in disguise as a Bordano overseer, but it's going to be tough because he's going to have to smell like shit and act like he doesn't notice it because they work in the sewers. So you're going to have to smell like raw sewage. Teg is like, OK, I'll do it. Let me just finish this confection and we can go. Delnay agrees to help. But only because the proprietor says that if he doesn't help Miles, he can never come back to this restaurant ever again, which I thought was super cute, even though that's not the real, real reason. But that was his cute, like little fake reason. So Ted goes, he's plastered with sewage, then he's hosed down and then they blow dry him to make him smell like total shit. And the disguise absolutely works. He makes it to this bar and... I love, I mean, I love all the little details of Gamu in these chapters in this last session, but I do love the little details about this bar and how it keeps its patrons. Like there's a weather station by the door and this weather station has like readings that can kind of be skewed about like what's going on outside. Like, oh, the temperature is a little bit colder than it actually is, or like it's windier than it is, or it's raining harder than it is, just so like to keep people inside. Um, 
And then it has an ingle nook fireplace burning aromatic wood. Beautiful. It has a low beamed ceiling that makes the room seem longer, but it's also more cozy. And it's like hearkening back to humanity's cave days. There's also free salted crisp uh, fried veggie nibbles to make you thirsty. And of course, the beers would be salted too to just trigger that thirst response and keep people there drinking all night. He gets inside and is guided to a private bathroom to wash up <laughs> and get changed back into his freshly cleaned and pressed uniform. He emerges and he heads to the Ingle Nook and groups and the groups go silent as they recognize him. They're like, oh, my God, it's the Bashar. Oh, I start with tag. I would know that guy anywhere. Delnay has put out the word to his old soldiers and they have shown up in force. The professor, like all the others who are there that evening, really want the honored mantras off their fucking neck. We fucking hate these hordes. We got to get rid of them. We're willing to help you, Teg. Someone passes Teg his favorite drink, a deep blue Danian marinette. That sounds fantastic. I want a deep blue Danian marinette. What does that even mean? I don't know. I looked up marinette. That's not a drink. Is it a drink? I don't think it is because I looked it up and I didn't find anything about it. Um, But it sounds fantastic. It's exactly Sly Raider. I don't know, but I want one. And the room has this quiet conversation with each other while they patiently wait for him to state his purpose. And the Bashar looks around and he recognizes faces from his past and laments that some of them are going to die tonight. Miles waits for everyone to start getting some drinking on and let that alcohol work its ancient magic until uh, he senses uh, Bacchus's presence in this room. Bacchus is here, which if you don't know, Bacchus is the Greek god of wine and being lit. <laughs> and, but before they get too lit, he calls for everyone's attention. He has someone guard the doors and no one is to go in and out until he gives the order. He asks his men if they can get their hands on some weapons quickly, and they respond, we have come prepared, all right? We're ready, dog. Tag announces that they are going to capture a no ship from the scattering, a feat rarely attempted because no ships are so closely guarded. But that's okay. Because Teg's new wild Atreides talents have surfaced. And he can see in his double vision where all of the no-ships are. Finally, finally, just as the Bene Gesserit have always wanted, there is someone who can see the no-ships in their, in their other vision. He asks a few people to stay behind and see that no one leaves or communicates with the outside world and that he thinks they will probably be attacked, but they need to hold out as long as they can. And the rest of y'all, get your weapons and let's go. Let's go. Let's get the fuck out of here. We're going to fuck it up. Um, Oh, Bacchus is the Roman one. The Greek god of wine is Dionysus. Good catch, PJ. Bacchus is the Roman god of wine, excuse me, and getting lit. (laughs) You're correct. Chapter 46, do what you must. And this one starts off with a Duke Leto quote. Justice, who asks for justice? We make our own justice. We make it here on Arrakis, win or die. Let us not rail about justice as long as we have arms and the freedom to use them. So I love that we we hearken back to a a wonderful Duke Leto quote that was, you know, kind of in the days leading up to his death in the Miles Tag death chapter. <laughs> in the chapter leading up to Miles Tag's death. Tag and the gang fly to Rackus on their stolen no ship. They did it, guys. They did it, fellas. They stole a no-ship, and they have flown to Rackus. And not only that, he's also linked up with Bersmali, Lucilla, Duncan, Mirbella. He's got all of them, plus all of his men. And Tug- Teg's doubled vision lets him know that they have not yet been spotted by unwanted eyes. So they're here on the planet. Nobody knows that they don't want them to know they're here is here. 
One of his men, a trusted officer, went to Ty, questions him, asking if he's certain that they, uh, they're going to be here. They're like, we're meeting some people out here. And he's like, well, are you sure? How do you know? And this man, this is one of the men who was drunk at the bar and originally was like, yeah, fuck yeah. Let's go steal a fucking no ship. I want to remember the good old days. Now, now that like the buzz is worn off and he's seen like some of his best friends die on Gamu, um, he's kind of like rethinking his whole position on this. And it's like, wait a minute. Fuck. What did I sign up for? Uh, I've left my family behind. I have no idea what's going to happen to them. I have no idea what's going to happen to me. I'm feeling a bit bitter about all of this. I feel like I've been tricked. I'm regretting this decision right now. And Teg lets him know that uh, they will be here soon, riding on the back of a worm, and that it was all arranged. Don't worry. And it was not arranged. It's just Teg's doubled vision lets him know this is where he needs to be. And this was a quote that I really thought was fantastic uh, and really hit me. It was true, Teg thought then, that the process of arranging conflicts involved the hoodwinking of large masses. How easy it was to fall into the attitude of the honored matres. Muck. The hoodwinking was not as difficult as some supposed. Most people wanted to be led. The officer back there had wanted it. There were deep tribal instincts, powerful unconscious motivations to account for this. The natural reaction when you began to recognize how easily you were led was to look for scapegoats. How easy it was to produce scapegoats and how readily they were accepted. This was especially true when the alternative was to find yourself either guilty or stupid or both. He wanted to yell to his people, look to the hoodwinking, then you'll know our true intentions. <laughs> it's just like, yes, look to the fucking hoodwinking. Like, just look to it. Like, just look, use your eyes, use your eyes. Oh God, it was, I just, I love this. I was like talking to a friend about this the other day when we were talking about some bullshit that's been going on in society. And it was just like, yes, there's this doom quote. It's like totally talking about all of this like so well. I know it really does hit Sly Raider. It's so, it hits really well. Especially, too, with, like, the scapegoat part and, like, you know, nobody wants to feel like they were stupid or they bought a lemon or whatever, you know. So, it's like, they're like, oh, you know, like, we fucked up, but we need to blame somebody else. And it's just like, ugh, it's just like this endless cycle um, for sure. Brismali and Lucilla both are asking to see Tag. And Miles asks that Brismali go back and stay with Duncan, looking on Marbella. But yes, bring Lucilla in. Lucilla comes in. She's extremely sus about this entire situation. She sees the changes in Teg. She doesn't know what's going on. She demands an explanation. He rebuffs her questions very well and explains that they don't have much time. Okay, the next satellite passage will show where we are on the planet's surface. And their enemies have taken control of the people in these planetary defenses above because they've taken their families hostage. Okay, so even though those are our people up there, the Honor Matres have control of them. We are here to pick up Odrade, Shiana, and their worm. Taraza is dead, and Odrade is in charge now, and you guys are going to go, and I'm going to remain here and create a diversion for you. And by diversion, he means he's going to create a hysteria in the Ottered Matres and make them believe that the Gola is here, and they're going to go so fucking crazy that they're probably going to sterilize the entire planet of all life, including the worms, but that it's okay um, because if this source of spice goes, he knows that the Bene Gesserit are going to figure out the secret of the axolotl tanks. And that eventually, even though they find it disgusting, they will overcome their disgust and they will use human bodies to produce spice for themselves if necessary. He then explains the Honored Matres have been trying to capture a worm and transplant one. But the trouble with Honored Matres is that they're too wealthy and they make the mistakes of the wealthy. And Lucilla is like, what the fuck? fuck are you talking about right now? like what are you talking about this is so much tag knows that lucilla may be at a loss right now but she will eventually pick up on tag's heightened abilities and he but the, by then he will be far out of her or anybody else's reach the sisterhood would scramble for his offspring though dimella his daughter and odrade his other daughter would not escape he sends lucilla to the entry port to receive odrade and company 
and he tells his bitter officer to alert Burzmali to take over command after they leave the ship. The officer asks him if he expects all of them to join him. You expect all of us to join you? Meh. <laughs> and he's like, look, I'm going out. I will go alone if necessary. Only those who wish need to join me. After that, all of them would come, he thought. Peer pressure was little understood by anyone except those trained by the Bene Gesserit. Uh, he's, ah, he's so good. He's so good at what he does. Silence falls on the command station and Miles takes a moment to reflect on the depraved whores of the honored matres. And this was another banger quote. This is like one of my favorite quotes. And I, I think about this one also. I've thought about it a lot over the years. It was not correct to call them depraved, he thought. Sometimes the supremely rich did become depraved. They, that came from believing that money, power, could buy anything and everything. And why shouldn't they believe this? They saw it happening every day. It was easy to believe in absolutes. It was like another faith. Money would buy the impossible. And I'm just like, oh, that's what's wrong with super rich people. Like, that's what's wrong with them. Like, oh, that makes sense. I see it. Like, any time I've been close to or around or just, you know, have experienced, like, massive wealth and, like, people with massive wealth, and it's just, like, there's just a real creepy vibe coming off some of these folks, you know? And it's just like, oh, like, uh, this is, like, what's going on here? And, like, this quote's just like, yes. Yes, this is exactly like, yes, like this is why they come. This is what happens and why they become so fucked up. Um, but honored matres are beyond depravity and had somehow come through depravity and were something so far gone that tech doesn't really care to think about it. These people are so fucked that they wouldn't hesitate to torture an entire planet if it meant personal gain or imagined pleasure or extended their life for even an hour. They had entirely lost the knack of moderation. And everybody, I'm here to tell you, moderation is the key. All right, moderation is fantastic. But as Oscar Wilde said, everything in moderation, including moderation. So uh, I know it sounds like a little bit of a paradox, but I try to be as moderate as I can. But there are times and places where it's time to get, to get loose and get wild. But then again, you have to still rein it back in. Rain it back in. Find, yes, find the balance, Alrock. Find the balance. Because again, if you go too far, you become numb. And you don't want to become numb. You have to take tolerance breaks. <laughs> you have to take tolerance breaks in your life for whatever it is. Casmataz, <sighs> um, temperance is my favorite card. Yes, temperance is all about moderation for sure. But it is true, Sparky. Sometimes you do have to treat yourself. So it's like, treat yourself, but, you know, don't be a fucking asshole about it. And you know, like, all of us know when we're going too hard. Like, we know it. You may not want to, like, face it. You may not want to deal with it. But you, deep down, you fucking know. Yeah, you can't be a burning man every day. You can't. You can't. So the worm approaches. And Tag orders Odrade to be brought to him alone. And she arrives. And Shiana is to stay in the hold with the worm. Enter Odrade, and he she catches Teg resting in his chair with his eyes closed. You know, but oh my God, when he opens his eyes and looks at her, she sees these changes in him. Like what has happened to this man? Like what has happened to him? Lucilla tried to kind of warn her, but like it didn't really make any sense. They didn't have a lot of time. And she asks him, how did you know to meet us here? Like, we didn't, we, I didn't even know where the worm was taking us. How would you fucking know where the worm was taking us? He says, a gambler's choice. Uh, fucking lies. A gambler's choice. He tells her, take the ship and go to the place that you know best, which is Chapter House, and take the Gola with you because they're going to need him to counter the whores. But he will not be able to leave the no ship. They've been spotted by a satellite. Tag mobilizes the gang to head outside and calls for Burzmali to take command and tells the Bashar to follow Odrade's directions. Before he leaves, he grabs Odrade's arm, kisses her cheek, and whispers, Do what you must, daughter. That worm in the hold may soon be the only one in the universe. 
Odrade sees that Tag has Taraza's complete design in his mind and is intending to carry it the fuck out. Do what you must, daughter. And he's kind of being a dick, but you know, I, I wish you. Uh, that's the one thing I was. I love Tag. Tag is the most base, but I feel like. Peg's vindictiveness towards Odrade. He needs to mellow out, okay? She's not that bad, okay? Like, he thinks, like, she's way worse than she is. It's like, no, it wasn't even, it wasn't even Daddy's approval because, like, in the book, it's like he says that he kind of does it, like, calls her daughter in, like, in a vindictive way. Like, it's kind of like he's kind of being a dick a little bit because, and I get it because he feels manipulated by the the sisterhood and that Odrade is not a daughter that he chose to have and she was like you know some Bene Gesserit woman was sent to have sex with him and he didn't know and like they got one over on him and got one of his fucking kids you know <laughs> like without his without his consent he did not consent to this daughter so he's a little yeah I'm not your damn stud exactly I rock like you know but, like, it's like, man, Odrade's cool. You know, she didn't ask to be born either, dude. Like, Odrade didn't ask to be born. So, like, you don't have to be a dick to her because she's fucking lit as shit. Like, she's so cool. Like, you guys are both great. Like, don't be a dick to her. On to our last chapter, chapter 47. Dar and Tar. When at last. <sighs> it's the last chapter. It is night. On the Bene Gesserit planet of Chapter House and Odrade, who is now the acting Reverend Mother Superior of the Bene Gesserit, at least for the moment, she is working out of Taraza's old room. And even though Taraza is dead, she is not entirely gone. Her memories are still integrating with Odrade's memories, and her personality is still very much alive within Dar's psyche, making cute little comments to her old friend, saying things like, Dar and Tar. One at last. <laughs> and now Odrade sees, I mean, she sees the full extent, but she sees like really the full extent of Taraza's maneuvering and how she carefully timed the leaking of word to the whores that the Leiloxu had built dangerous abilities into this Duncan, knowing that they would kill an entire planet to get rid of this Duncan, to get rid of this Gola. And how much... Uh, and she wonders at how much Taraza's plan depended on Tag and the human decisions he would make for the sisterhood. I mean, it worked out, but like that was a fucking gambler's choice right there. She looks up at the bust of Sister Chenoa in its niche, the guardian symbol of Chapter House, and feels that she cannot remove this sculpture. And not because she's superstitious and thinks it will be a bad omen, but because she understands the value of tradition and that the bust carries with it a sense of continuity in this space. And even though she will keep Sister Chenoa, she wants to add a new niche and have a bust of Miles Tegg created, the great heretic. Yes. Odrade thinks on the destruction of Rackus, of Miles, and the sandworms, all gone at the blundering hands of honored Matre violence. So they did come. They did sterilize the planet. Everyone's dead. The Church of the Divided God, gone. Tuic, dead. Sandworms, everything. The bazaar, all of it, fucking gone. She thinks of poor dead Waff, who had succumbed to the honored Matres just once with one of my own face dancers. But he could never admit it. He could never admit that he had become an addict. And how Ix, the guild, and the fish speakers were all net set to fall together in the face of competition from the scattering. And there are just so many questions. Did Tag become Prishan at the end? He did, but she doesn't know for sure. Did he become Prishan at the end? Was he able to see the no ships? He totally was able to see the no ships. Whatever the case, the many Gesserit have retreated into a fortress position for the Long night of the horse. <laughs> I love that description. The long night of the horse. Shiana had, Shiana has the Sion of blood. So she's able to leave the no ship. But Duncan, he's a mixture of a lot of Idaho gullas. And he has some Sion of blood, but not enough. And they're not willing to chance it. So he's got to stay inside the no ship until they figure out what the fuck to do with him. And poor Marbella. Poor, pregnant Marbella. 
an honored matre dishonored. <sighs> uh, what are they going to do with her? I mean, are they going to put her back in with Duncan? Would he try to kill her? She doesn't know, but they're going to try it with protective measures and see what happens. Miles Tegg had left his last will and testament behind, outlining how Shiana needs to lure the sandworm out of the hold and into an earth dammed basin filled with melange and then flooded with water. The resulting sand trout will then begin their long transformation of the planet into a desert and eventually sandworms will live again. And this is exactly what they are going to do on Chapter House. They are going to make it a new rackus. He said many important things in his will. One of those things is you seldom learn the names of the truly wealthy and powerful. You see only their spokesmen. The political arena makes a few exceptions to this, but does not reveal the full power structure. Very true. He also urges the Bene Gesserit to destroy their archives, saying the writing of history is largely a process of diversion. Most historical accounts divert attention from the secret influences around the recorded events and warns that true histories are subject to the destruction of as many copies as possible, a.k.a. book burning, burying the two revealing accounts in ridicule, AKA, you know, con like the CIA came coming up with the term conspiracy theorist to, you know, anyone who's like, oh, I've got an idea of what happened. And then now you can mock that person, be like, oh, they're a conspiracy theorist. But then, like, how many times are people labeled conspiracy theorists? And then later it turns out they were fucking right. You know, I mean, not all of them, but some of them are correct. Also, uh, ignoring them in the centers of education and ensuring that they are not quoted elsewhere. And in some cases, and in some cases, elimination of the authors. So there are many ways to get rid of the truth. And these happen all the fucking time. Even the Bashar's daughter, Odrade, has argued in council that we've always known what was at stake in conflicts. Uh, and that was the determination of who would control the wealth or the equivalent. She puts these thoughts aside and takes a thopter to the nose ship and visits Duncan. He's bitter, of course, and he accuses her of leaving Tag back there to die. And Audrey defends herself, saying, you know, I did, <laughs> I did what I must, and I obeyed his orders. He's still on his, I'm not going to be a stud for the witches. I'm no damn stud for you. And Odrade is like, yeah, 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 cool. Did you read Tag's last will and testament? Did you read my father's last will and tag testament? What did you think of it? And Duncan had no idea that Odrade was Tag's daughter. She tells him that they have been trapped too long in the tyrant's oracular maze and that he can't, uh, and that also Duncan is not going to be able to escape alive from this ship, but they want him to live a useful life. They don't want to kill him, but they can't let him out. Duncan says that he will never breed for them, especially not with that little twit from Arrakis. I am not fucking Shiana now or ever. Never. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, wondering what Shiana would think of that. But again, she's like, whatever, dude, it's fine. We still, we're going to have your child from Marbella. So we'll have one. It's okay. Do whatever you want. And then he admits that, I know, Davy Stockrocker, Duncan is like, my peen, my choice. I know he always says that, but then he like, and he's like, oh, never fuck Siona, like in God Emperor. And then what does he do? What does he do? He fucks the shit out of Siona later. So it's like, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what's going on. He admits that he's been talking to Marbella on the comm, on the phone, and that she thinks that they're going to accept her into the Bene Gesserit. And Adrade's like, yeah, we are. And Duncan thinks that they are total idiots. They're like, really? You're you really? You're going to let Marbella in? Audrey lets him know that they know exactly what this dumb bitch is thinking. She's thinking, oh, I'm going to learn all your secrets, and then I'm going to escape. And Audrey is very confident that that is not going to happen because once we get them, we never really lose them. Even Lady Jessica returned to them in the end. All right. So 
Get them while they're young, they're yours forever. <laughs> but all this isn't why I'm here, Duncan. I'm here to explain to you that Taraz's main goal in all of this was the destruction of Rackus and almost all of the sandworms. Because all of those sandworms each had a little pearl of Leto's oracular awareness locked inside of them, and they were keeping the universe in bondage to the vents that he had created with his prescience. And the one sandworm in our hold that we still have, it has one pearl, true, but it's going to be dissolved. And by the time it reestablishes itself, and by the time we have a lot more sandworms, humanity will have gone way past uh, whatever dream that Leto had. And we'll be doing too many different things. And so no single force will rule over our futures completely ever again. We will finally be rid of this fucking curse of the Kwisatz Haderach. It's our fault. We did it. <laughs> We're excited about being free from the tyrant. Exactly, Kazma does. We're going to be free and it's going to be great. And I know this sucks that you have to stay here, but I promise you, Duncan, that I will help you in any way I can because my ancestors loved you and my father loved you. And Duncan's being a bitch and he angrily pronounces, witches can't feel love. And Audrey tells him, I feel what I feel. And your water is ours, Duncan Idaho. Whew. Duncan's like, oh, fuck, you got me. <laughs> Before she leaves the ship, she goes to look at the captured sandworm and shares a silent laugh with Terraza in her mind. We were right, and Shwang Yu and her people were wrong. We knew that he wanted out, and he had to want that after what he did. She softly whispers for herself and the observers that are listening in, we have your language now. There were no words in the language, only a moving, dancing adaptation to a moving, dancing universe. You could only speak the language, not translate it. To know the meaning, you had to go through the experience, and even then the meaning changed before your eyes. Noble purpose was, after all, an untranslatable experience. And that's one thing. Again, I thought about Alejandro Jodorowsky and he calls like life the dance of reality, you know, like it is a dance. You got to get with it. You got to start moving, you know, like that's what life is. It's movement. I think it's very beautiful. I really liked this ending paragraph in this ending chapter. She calls down to the sandworm. Hey, old worm, was this your design? You know, and there was... No answer, but then she had not really expected an answer. And that concludes Heretics of Doom Club. Yes. Wow. What a powerful book. This book is so good. I'm so glad that we got to read this together. And we're going to take a little bit of break here on Twitch, but we will be back this year with chapter house doom club starting sunday november 6th live here on twitch.tv slash danica xix at 3 30 p.m pacific time that's right and um for those of you who are getting ready for chapter house you need to read pages. Oh, wait, hold on. Let me, let me grab Hold on. Let me grab the new book. Oh, my gosh. Oh, okay. Okay, here we go. And for our first session of Chapter House Dune Club, you need to read pages 1 through 95. And the last sentence, I think I have this. Oh no, did it, did it? no, I didn't put it in here. Oh, I made a thing, fucked it up. The last sentence of the last chapter of session one of Chapter House Doom Club is, what have we done? Israel help us, or no, Israel help her. Sorry, let me do it one, one more time, take two. What have we done? Israel help her. Pages one through 95. So that'll be November 6th. Um, I am very excited to read this final Dune book 
with all of you lovely people and finish Frank Herbert's Dune Cycle with all of you wonderful Fremen warriors. Yeah, Daiso, spoilers, space shoes. <laughs> Yes, yes. Get ready for space shoes. Get ready for uh, more descriptions of food. Get ready for a lot of Mirbella and Duncan being fucking assholes and being crazy. Get ready for uh, a lot of fun. I mean, Shiana like grows up. Like we see what Shiana looks like. I mean, it's just it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And I'm really excited. I mean, Lucilla comes back. Odrade is obviously still here. Like you got all these characters and I'm, I'm not going to spoil everything. I, some of you have read along and I've seen some of you in the chat talking about some of the other characters who make a surprise appearance. We're not going to talk about them, but they're, it's, it's cool. It's cool as fuck. I'm excited to read it with you and it's going to be fantastic. So I just want to thank everyone out there who has participated in Heretics of Dune Club. Uh, thank you so much for all of your participation, for all of your support, for all of you who've been here in live, uh, to all of those of you out there on YouTube, to those of you who've bought merch, to those of you who've been asking questions on Patreon. Uh, this has just been a fantastic experience and super fun. And I just learn so much every time I do one of these things, because when I read this book, and I'm just me by myself. I just like, there's so much stuff that I miss that I'm like, I just kind of gloss over a lot of things, but leading these book clubs really forces me to take a really hard look at these books and really look in all the little nooks and crannies and challenge myself to understand some of the things that maybe went over my head the first time or second time I've read it. And uh, it's been, it's just, it's a, it's a treat. It's a pleasure. It's an honor leading you through the deserts of Arrakis, even though Arrakis has been fucking exploded. Oh my God. Can you believe it? He killed Arrakis. Oh my God. He was just like, oh, we're going to blow it up. Fuck it. Like, I love you, Frank Herbert. Thank you so much for blowing up Arrakis. That's hilarious. You're amazing. Sometimes you have to kill your babies, you know, as... As a creative, you have to, and he totally did. So yes, Jasper Aitzman did not see it coming. Yes, and to all my OG DC people, Davey Stockrocker and, and PJ, and I mean, so many of you out there, original Gangsta Doom Club, and uh, thank you guys for being here and just coming back. This has been fantastic. Um, so I, I just love it. Yes, it's really, it's really fun. <laughs> Derek is enthusiasm and infectious. Well, I'm so glad. I was telling my fruit man today because he was telling me he stopped at, you know, Dune Messiah. And I was like, I know, it's really sad, but like, you keep going. <laughs> and I was trying to convince my fruit man at the farmer's market to, to keep fucking reading Dune. So, um, so yes, uh, thank you again, everyone. And, um, we're gonna we're gonna take a break and when we come back we are going to go over some questions and answer answers and observations from my cuties on patreon so that's gonna be great i'm really excited to see what you guys have to say and we're just gonna talk about it a little bit more oh thank you for the bits kazmataz thank you so much and i will hopefully see you all back again november 6th for the beginning of chapter house dune club coming soon <laughs> to, to a YouTube and a Twitch near you. Mwah!